Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so we'll uh, get started here by just uh, finishing off the drying example that we were looking at yesterday. And um, the point where we ended up yesterday was by giving the solution here showing that the drying time uh, delta T is given by this equation that we spent uh, at the prior class deriving. So saying that it's the mass of water that we have to remove multiplied by the heat of vaporization. And then in the denominator, we have the heat transfer coefficient, the area that we're drying, and then the temperature difference. Now let's just uh, quickly uh, look at that a bit. We uh, subbed in the numbers yesterday. That's all straightforward, and we got 4.6 hours. And I'd like just to do the final step Remember that when we've, um, we look at this, we, we look at our problem, we define what we're trying to do, what we know, what we don't know. We explore what aspects are related to the problem. We understand and, and try to figure out what assumptions are reasonable. This is important um, in many of our applications where we're making strong assumptions often in order to use an equation or to use some concepts that we've learned. So we went through some of those assumptions yesterday um, that one in particular that's in critical is that the area remains constant and that these other constants, <coughs> heat of vaporization, dry bulb, wet bulb temperature, they remain constant. And of course, that all the heat that you're providing goes to drying this, the liquid and not to um, heating up the solid. So making those assumptions is part of the explore phase. Then we plan our approach, we do it, and then the final step is to check. And we didn't get a chance to look through the check phase yesterday. And I just wanted to go through that on this case study just to, just to make sure that some things seem reasonable. The first thing I'd like to check is that value of G. Okay, so let's look at G. G is uh, regularly given as the density of air times the average velocity. But if we're using it in a correlation, um, the correlations require us just to, to change the units to kilograms per hour per meter squared. Regularly, the units are kilograms per second per meter squared. So the 3,600 there is to get the units into the form required by the correlation. Um, so let's just examine that. Is 13,740 kilograms per hour per meter squared a reasonable value? Does it seem like a, a number that might be realistic for a piece of equipment? Okay. Another way of saying that is 13 tons per hour. 13 tons per hour of what? Water, air, solids. It's 13 tons per hour of air per meter squared in the dryer. Okay? It's, and does that seem reasonable? 13.7 tons per hour of air. It's, it's, it seems, it, it, it's a realistic value. Over an entire hour, we're moving 13,700 kilograms of air through our dryer per meter squared, right? So a, a large fan can quite comfortably move that much air over an entire hour, okay? If you can re rewrite that back into a per second basis if you want a smaller time unit, but that seems realistic. It's not um, entirely unreasonable. Remember, um, if we're just looking at this fact that the density is one kilogram per meter cubed, and that the average velocity here in this case is three meters per second. These are realistic numbers for moving air around. Um, gases easily move around in the order of one to 30 meters per second. So uh, a three meters per second flow is not totally unrealistic. Okay, so G seems fine. H then, we got a value of 41.7. 
watts per meter squared Kelvin. Does that seem realistic? That's pretty reasonable. Given the context of the numbers we were looking at yesterday, values around 30, 35, 40 isn't entirely unreasonable. So that check seems fine. And so nothing else seems out of place here. A value of 4.6 hours then to dry a two meter squared uh, piece of material and remove 20 kilograms of water off it isn't um, that unrealistic, right? If you look at the time it takes to dry your clothes just by hanging it out, right? That's, it's within that ballpark. We're, if you've got 46 hours or 400 hours, you might start to consider that you've made, it a, made a mistake. Or if you've got um, 0.4 hours, you might consider that you've made a mistake. But this is a, 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 a number that's quite reasonable in the realm of expectation. Okay, so that's checking. Now let's ask this question. 4.6 hours is too long to satisfy your needs for your company. How are you going to reduce that? Let's hear some suggestions. How might you reduce this time to dry your solids? Increase the velocity. Okay, that's one suggestion. Another one. Back here. Increase the increase the exposed area. Great. Increase the dry bulb temperature. Okay, so we've got three suggestions. So let's work with two of them. Uh, this half of the class, from this side over here, I'd like you to try the just quickly rework the numbers using a velocity of six meters per second. And this side of the class, I'd like you to work the numbers with a dry bulb temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. Okay, this one on this side, it's not obvious what's going to happen. Take this one seriously, give it a shot, see.
should take you a fairly short time just to rework the numbers. Got an answer? People here on this side, did you get what you expect? Okay, so let's, let's take a look at these. Which one do you suspect might have the greatest effect? Increasing the velocity or increasing the temperature? Increasing the velocity might have the greatest effect. Why might increasing temperature not be so beneficial? Okay, it changes the wet bulb temperature as well. Okay, so we'll look at that. Which one is going to be cheaper to implement? Likely changing the velocity is likely going to be the most uh, cost effective to implement. Okay, so let's just work through these numbers. Do they? Uh, do we get what we expect? If we increase the velocity, G should go up or down? Up, of course. And numbers there for G? Sorry? Around 21,000. Tw oh. That was what I got, 20,600. Yes? Yes, no? I may have made a mistake. Um, so kilograms per hour... That's pretty. Okay, H then, heat transfer coefficient changes to 55, 56, 57. Okay, in the order of 57 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So our H has gone up from 41 to 57. So it's gone up by a fair amount. Okay, we've, even though we've made the velocity, we've gone from 4 meters per second to 6 meters per second. That's a 50% increase. We don't get a 50% increase in the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, that makes sense because the heat transfer coefficient isn't linearly related to H. There's that f factor of 0.8. So that's reducing, giving us diminishing returns over there. And then your drying time, um, I got some numbers here, 3.3, did you guys say? Okay, so 3.3 hours. So a, f a, fair, a fair reduction in um, the drying time. Let's take a look here at the dry bulb change. Okay, so when you change the dry bulb temperature, what else changed in that equation? Suggestions? We, yeah, Daniel? The wet bulb temperature changes, and when the wet bulb temperature changes, uh, delta H VAP, strictly speaking, also changes. You have to go reinterpolate that. So let's just make sure we understand that um, when the wet bulb temperature changes, oh, sorry, when the dry bulb temperature changes, we've gone from 80%, 80 degrees Celsius. Um, let's see if I can, I don't know if this will work so well. So we've gone from 80 degrees at 10% humidity, so we were somewhere around here. And then we go down and get our wet bulb temperature. If we go, when we started at 75 degrees and at 10%, where were we? We were somewhere over here. We were like that. So it may not come out quite as clearly, but let me uh, just put some numbers up here on the board, then uh, you can verify that. So. When the dry bulb temperature was 75 degrees Celsius, our wet bulb temperature from before was 41.3. This time, our dry bulb temperature is 80 degrees Celsius. And what wet bulb values did you guys get? 40, 47, okay. So your, temp, your driving force here, your delta T driving force is in the order of 34 degrees 
here your driving force is in the order of 33 degrees, 33, 34 still. Okay, so actually changing only your dry bulb temperature didn't get you any significant uh, change in drying time. That's interesting, right? We said yesterday, we looked at that equation and we said, well, that should make sense, right? But what the problem was we were looking at changing the dry bulb temperature independently of the wet bulb temperature, and you can't do that. Right? When you change one, the other changes as well. There's a relationship between them given by the psychrometric charts. So what is one way then we can increase our temperature? What else should we be doing if we want a, a shorter drying time? You need to be adjusting the humidity as well. Okay? So not only increase uh, temperature, also decrease the humidity. It needs to go with that. Okay? And that way you'll get a larger spread or a larger uh, deviation here on this x-axis. That's what we want. We want to push these numbers as far apart as possible on that axis. And the only way to do that is to go to higher temperatures and lower humidities at the same time. Now that's going to cost us money because we're now spending more money to heat our air and we have to dehumidify that air, remove water out of it, and that's going to cost money as well. Okay, so not, not so easy to do this, a whole lot easier to do that and increase the velocity. Okay, there was also the suggestion of adjusting area. Let me, um, let me take a look at that and I'll... Um, Look at this example here. We could adjust the area by taking that solid. There was the solid we saw yesterday. Um, and I said we put it down as flat sheets, but you could go break it up into small particles. Okay. Break it up into sort of like the consistency of stone or sand. And then we, remember when we looked at particle size distributions, we learned about equivalent diameters. We said that we could go find the equivalent diameter of sphere. Now when we break up that material, we're not going to get beautiful spheres. We're going to get irregular shaped particles. So we need to then calculate an effective diameter, the effective diameter of a sphere that would have the same surface area. And what we can then do is we calculate that diameter, effective diameter, and we can go use a different heat transfer correlation. So here's Here's the equation. We look these up, right? We, uh, the same way we looked up that prior correlation for parallel flow and the correlation we used yesterday for perpendicular flow, we can simply look up another correlation for pellets in a packed bed. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a bed. It's not going to be closed here at the bottom. We're going to pack these particles in a bed and move our hot air through it. Okay? That sort of way of drying the particles is going to have a very different heat transfer coefficient, h. And correlations for h then are given by these two equations, depending on our Reynolds number being greater or smaller than 350. Okay, so let me, um, let me challenge you now to try this calculation using that new correlation. And let's assume we can break our particles up so that they have about one centimeter diameter. So see and calculate what your heat transfer coefficient is for this situation. So I'll give you a few minutes to calculate that. This is our third option. We've investigated velocity. We've investigated uh, our dry bulb temperature. Let's go and investigate our particle size now as one option.
Okay, what's your Reynolds numbers? Anyone got a Reynolds number calculated yet? No. Why calculate the Reynolds number first? You have to figure out which correlation you're going to use, right? So any, any values for that yet? Any suggested numbers? Yeah, Michelle? Uh, 1908. Any other? Does that sound right with calculated values? 1908. Okay, so make sure G is in SI units. In other words, uh, don't use hours. Hours is not an SI unit. Seconds is. So G must be um, expressed as, in this case, simply just rho times V average. Okay, that will get you SI units. Our density was From before, we used the inverse humid heat, the velocity, let's just use the four meters per second from last time. And we can, uh, we've got dp there in millimeters, so we can calculate our Reynolds number, then is 0 0.1. We're told our viscosity of air is in the order of 2 to the times 10 to the minus 5. Okay? The reason why it's SI units is because it must cancel out. We've got a viscosity in units of kilograms per meters per second. So in our numerator, we must have the same units so that we get cancellation. And then you'll get a Reynolds number of 1908. Mistake, yes. The particle diameter is 0 0.01 meters. Okay, so we've got our Reynolds number, then any heat transfer coefficients, H. Firstly, let's, before we even calculate it, do we expect H to be larger than the values of about 30 or 40, 50 that we got on the prior part? Smaller heat transfer coefficients, larger. Larger heat transfer coefficients, less resistance. Okay, so um, the path through a packed bed is very tortuous and going to really wipe away that boundary layer. So we should get smaller resistances, higher heat transfer coefficients. So when we sub in over here, again, this is a correlation. G is back in its irregular units um, of kilograms per hour per meter squared. So we're into the uh, correlation over here, 0.151. G is from before, we don't even need to calculate this. Um, we've got it over here. G is 13740. That's my G value. Raised to the power of 0.59. And then in my denominator, I've got the particle diameter raised to the power of 0.41. So 0 0.01. Okay, and then that uh, gives you a heat transfer coefficient in the order of 275 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Okay. How do you know that G is now not in SI units? Okay, how do you know that G is not in SI units? The correlation indicates that for you. So the correlation will say use G in these units. Okay, I, I should have added that to the slide that G here is in the units. What had happened is the, I, there's a table of correlations and I, um, I've split it over two slides. So it, on the prior slide it was over here that G is in those. Okay, so this was one, two, part three was, uh, was here. See textbooks for using pelletized solids, e.g. pack bed. Uh, G is then in those, um, those units, but it, you'll, you'll see it specified. But the key is to calculate the Reynolds number. Reynolds number must have cancellation of the units, and so we have to use consistent set of units.
to do the Reynolds number. Okay, always check your correlations as well. As we saw there earlier, that correlation had bounds for Reynolds number. When we were looking earlier at parallel flow to the surface, that correlation is only valid between those bounds of G. Right? So we, we always have to pre-check that. We, we didn't actually do that last time. We we're lucky that 13,000, the value for G falls between those two, um, but we should have gone and checked that actually. Okay. So three options we've investigated to eliminate the drying time. Here we've got much higher heat transfer coefficients. Um, so we can be sure that this approach is going to get us far, far faster drying times um, in the order of minutes now instead of hours to um, dry those same solids. Okay, any questions on, on that before calling this a wrap for, on that section? Okay, so 